Welcome Neighborhood Church. Thank you for being with us this happy Sunday. I hope you enjoyed your get together last week. Right now we're wrapping up John 4 with the story of the government official and his son. Let's open our Bibles and we're going to read John 4 starting in verse 43. At the end of the two days Jesus went on to Galilee. He himself had said that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown. Yet the Galileans welcomed him, for they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and had seen everything he did there. As he traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a government official in nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son, who was about to die. Jesus asked, will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? The official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. Then Jesus told him, go back home, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. While the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better, and they replied, Yesterday afternoon at one o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. Then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. I love that John included this miracle. Let's face it, when we're talking about miracles, Jesus walking on the water, the feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the blind and the lame. It's hard to wrap our minds around that. Not that we don't believe that it happened. We just stand in awe of it. It's a big deal. Not everybody can do it. But a kid with a fever, that we get. We understand that. We know this about the government official. He has a government job. He has servants. So he's probably well off. He has a house on the Sea of Galilee. And we also know that none of these things matter when your child is ill. His child has a fever. This is not a fever of today. This is a fever of a time when there are no antibiotics, no fever reducers. It is certainly considered deadly. Capernaum is about 20 miles from Cana. That's a long way to go when your kid's in trouble. He's desperate. He's fearful, and this is probably a last ditch effort. We know he has the means to maybe have many doctors. Either way, they are now all in agreement that there is nothing more that can be done. Parents, you at one time or another have found yourselves careening down the roadway to the emergency room. You know this guy. You've been this guy. You can't get to help fast enough. When we rely on natural faith, the doctors, the pharmacies, test results, those are limited. What happens when there, no, when there are no more answers? The father now has to make a painful decision. Do I leave my dying child or do I try everything humanly possible? Most, most of us would go down swinging. So he begins his 20 mile journey to see Jesus. It's not hard to find Jesus, as you just must look for the crowd that seems to always surround him. As he approaches the crowd, Jesus is saying, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Jesus also reminds us that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown. Jesus is on his home turf. Nazareth is right up the road. This is his backyard. But some in the crowd might know him only as Joseph's kid, the son of a carpenter. Sure, they're welcoming. They too have witnessed the signs and wonders at the Passover in Jerusalem. It could be that they don't think the neighborhood kid could possibly be the Messiah, or they are just happy to have the show in town. And you know that crowd is silent. Jesus is calling them out. You've already seen what I can do, but you refuse to believe. But here is the voice of the one person 
who has the courage to step out in fear. Not faith, he has none. Fear has a place. Fear, like faith, can give you the courage to say and do things that you normally wouldn't do. Verse 49, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. The government official who has authority over everyone there, this is his jurisdiction, is calling Jesus Lord. Lord, as the one who has absolute and supreme authority, unlimited power, that Lord. You are Lord, not me. You have the authority to heal, not me. Then Jesus told him, go home, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said. Wait, what? No metabolic panel run, no blood work, no MRI, no prescription. Just go home? And he heads home. The truth is on the move, people. The word of the Lord is in action. Jesus spoke it. He obeyed it. Faith. He trusts Jesus at his word. No proof is needed. Jesus is proclaiming that he can heal regardless of time and distance. This is the miracle. We read the Gospels of how Jesus was always preparing his disciples of a time where he would not be there. We get the benefit of being able to read the New Testament. We understand how this works. But the woman at the well and the official, they are frontline believers. They are passing the message of Jesus forward. I have a niece who was very ill. The doctors did not know what was wrong with her, and she was fading fast. I was living in Michigan, and after an agonizing phone call with my sister, I hung up the phone, went into my bedroom, and knelt at the side of my bed, and for the first time in my life, I prayed. I knelt there for a while, crying, okay, sobbing, afraid not only for her little life, but that I didn't know how to pray. My niece's life was hanging in the balance and I didn't know what to say. But Satan had a word for me. He said, look at your life. You have done nothing worthy for him to listen, let alone answer you. And I knew he was right. But remember, fear has its place. I took a deep breath and I said, Jesus, I have done nothing for you to hear my prayer. But I beg of you, whatever this is, take it off of her and give it to me. Give it to this sinner. A couple weeks later, she had another episode. And due to circumstances under God's control, they had to go to a different emergency room. And that emergency room doctor knew what was wrong. The Lord is so faithful. He gives so abundantly. Not only did the doctor know what was wrong, he knew of a specialist in town. Fear has its place. It will either drive you to Jesus or it won't. But Jesus will not enter your crisis unless he's asked. While the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with great news. Then he asked when the boy had begun to get better. And they replied, yesterday around one o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. Not that the fever broke, it's gone, which means the infection is gone. The father realized that this was the exact time that Jesus told him his son would live, time and distance. Now him and his entire family believe. I am sure the official told his servants about what happened. Hearing what took place, they also believed. This just isn't about believing. This is about salvation. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Is his faith deep? No. Can he quote scripture? No. But then again, neither could the criminal on the cross, and he made it into the kingdom. Jesus is not only giving him the gift of healing, he's giving him the gift of time, both for him and his family. Everyone in the household is saved. Servants, children, their children. The gift is generational. If you haven't figured it out yet, Jesus is all about the personal. 
story after story in the Bible, the woman at the well, the adulterous woman, the blind man, the lame man, and now the government official and his son. From the beginning of chapter 4, we understand that Jesus does not care about your economic status, your race, your gender, or what society has to say about you. This is between you and him. Luke 15, 4 tells us the story of the lost sheep. Look, he has left Samaria. Hundreds of people are saved because of hearing his word. Let's call them the 99. And he comes to Cana for the one, the one who is lost. As we end John 4, let's tie the first and second Cana miracles together. Jesus' first miracle, he changed water into wine. He changed nothing into something. Follow me. He turned my nothing into something, the government official's nothing into something. Our faith, like wine, over time matures. It has more depth, it's sweeter, and it is certainly more valuable. Now that's a miracle. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you for your love and your trust that you have upon us. We thank you for a way that when we are in trouble, we can call out to you. Whether it's a groan or whether it's a full-on prayer, Lord Jesus, we know those are straight to heaven. Lord, you tell us in Matthew 18, when two of you get together on anything at all on the earth and make it a prayer, my Father in heaven goes into action. How precious. Thank you. Amen.